Well, good afternoon again. Uh, this is my attempt to re-record the first 20 minutes of today's lecture after the slight error we made during the live session. Um, we're now on lecture 17, uh, which is the second forming lecture. Uh, today we're going to be covering material behaviour and we're starting to look in a little bit more detail at extrusion. So the outline, uh, we'll start off with a recap. Uh, the first lecture last week, uh, we started by introducing metal forming processes, a little excursion around the ways you can change the shape of material to make it useful. Um, we covered forging, rolling, extrusion and deep drawing as four typical processes. Um, and we classified them. Uh, you can classify them in terms of bulk or sheet deformation. So that's the both the feedstock that comes in uh, and also the thing that you are producing. So a sheet deformation process would be deep drawing. A bulk deformation process would be forging. We classified them as hot or cold. If you remember that these two have distinct advantages and disadvantages. If you form hot, the metal is softer and more ductile, so the forming loads are lower uh, and uh, you can put much more strain into it before anything goes wrong. Uh, it of course has downsides of it being hot and therefore potentially dangerous and you tend to form oxide on the surface while you're doing it and that can lead to poor surface finish. Uh, cold is an example there will be deep drawing where you, although the loads you have to apply are higher um, you end up with a better surface finish because you don't have atmospheric attack on the surface and then the complicated one steady state or non-steady state if you can watch its shape changing like thumping something with a hammer it's a non-steady state process if you stand and watch it like material going into a pair of rolls and coming out the other side. It's a steady state process because at any one time, as far as you can see, the thickness on the upside and the thickness on the downside are not changing. All that's happening is material is feeding in on one side and feeding out on the other. We then looked in a little more detail at forging and rolling. Um, we won't be looking at them in any more detail now. So today, our lecture 17, um, we're going to start off by looking at mechanical testing and material properties relevant for forming operations. In other words, how do we get the mechanical properties of the metals that we're going to use, what mechanical properties are useful um, in order to work out whether your material is suitable for your forming operation and indeed perform calculations on that forming operation. We're going to come back then to extrusion and we're going to start looking at it in a little bit more detail. We're going to look at types of extrusion operation. We're going to start to look at the load displacement response during extrusion, which of course is more complex than you might think and we'll carry that forward into tomorrow's lecture as well. So why do we do all of this? Well, we can do simple analyses of metal forming processes. Um, we don't do this just so we can examine you on them. We do these because we can predict the forces involved, which is important because you need to know how hard you have to push it, you need to know how stiff your equipment has to be, you need to know how big and expensive it has to be. Uh, we can use these simple analyses to make estimates of whether we're going to actually produce a usable product or not, uh, avoiding defects. And predicting the forces, as I said, permits correct design of tooling and appropriate machine tools. So in other words, if you're forming, how big a press do you need to make your component? And to predict forming forces, we need to understand certain features of the material response. And that's what we'll do in the first part of this lecture. We want to look at the stress strain behavior, which I hope is not an unfamiliar concept to you. We're going to look at the flow stress, something called the flow stress, which is important in metal forming. And we're going to look at the impact of friction on forming operations. 
Now we could do all of this using sophisticated numerical modeling. Um, and packages to do this exist and people use them, but we won't be attempting it. We'll be doing simple pencil and paper calculations. So let's start off with material properties. Here we have a little rectangular cuboid made of metal and it's got a cross-sectional area on the ends A. And we put a load on it. We put a force F on it. And once we put that force F on, we need to convert that in something that's area independent. So we define stress. Stress sigma is the force over the area. And there's a little bit of wrinkle here because if we are using the instantaneous cross-sectional area, of that end, then we call this a true stress. If we're engineers and we want something simpler, we usually use something called the engineering stress, uh, which is the load over the original cross-sectional area of the face which is applied on. And A0 then is the original cross-sectional area at zero load. Now, because uh, metals change their shape, and change their volume during loading, um, the true stress and the engineering stress are not always the same. If the loads are small and the strains are small, they're very close to each other. But in general terms, they're not quite the same. So then we move on to strain. Our little rectangular cuboid has got a length L0 at zero load. If we load it, it stretches. And you will notice it also contracts in the lateral directions. You may remember something called Poisson's ratio, which is a measure of how much contraction you get perpendicular to the uh, faces on which you apply the load. So that stretches to a length L1 under the applied force F. L naught's the length corresponding to zero load. L1 is the length after the load is applied. And we can then define something called strain. The first one we'll define is the true strain or logarithmic strain. And you'll see why it's a true strain later. And that's defined as the in integral of the increment in length over the current length between the original length and the final length. And you can see those in the integral sign there. So the integral between L naught and L1 of delta L over L. And when you do that integral, you find it actually comes out as a natural logarithm. It's the natural logarithm of final length over initial length. And it has the symbol E that you can see there. Now, engineers usually use a simpler definition, the engineering strain, epsilon, and that is defined as the final length minus the original length divided by the original length. You notice both of these are dimensionless. So true strain and engineering strain are related, and you can see that if you substitute the equation for engineering strain inside the brackets for the equation for true strain, and you'll find that what you get is true strain is the logarithm of one plus the engineering strain. So they are not the same. If the strains are very small, they are very close and it doesn't really matter what you use. If the strains are large, they're different and we'll come back later to why it's then better to use a true strain. So, what do we use these measures for? Well, you will have been hopefully introduced to the concept of tensile testing of metals. Um, you often determine the basic mechanical properties of an engineering metal through a tensile test. And what you do, of course, is you put your specimen into a testing machine, you grip it in a set of grips and you pull it and you measure the load displacement response which you can then convert into a relationship between stress and strain. So in a tensile test, the load acting on the materials increased at a steady rate while the deformation is measured until it fractures. And the strain rate is usually controlled 
because the mechanical properties of materials tend to vary with the strain rate. Um, so a testing standard will tell you what range of strain rate you should be working over to get a representative result. And depending on the temperature and the material that you're testing is whether the response is very sensitive to strain rate or hardly sensitive at all. But testing standards take account of this, they'll tell you what range you should be using. And here's a picture of the sort of specimens that you test. Uh, there's cylindrical ones there, and they're also flat dog bone ones. And they all have similar characteristics. They'll have a reduced test section, which is where you want to measure or calculate the stress, and you want to measure the deformation, and where you want the final failure to occur. And then they have a stronger end section, which is where you fit it into the testing machine. You don't want it to deform a lot there, and you certainly don't want it to break there. And then here's the video, which I won't show you on this rerun, which you can watch to see how a tensile specimen, first of all, stretches in a uniform fashion, and then ultimately strain localizes at a given point, which we call a neck. The section decreases a lot and it fractures in the neck. So have another look at that and then move on. When we plot the response during a tensile test, we'll get something like what's coming here. Um, so we're plotting engineering stress on the y-axis and engineering strain on the x-axis. So you start on the bottom left at the origin at zero load, zero deformation, zero stress and zero strain. Initially, the stress rises in proportion to the strain. There's a linear portion and you'll remember that this is where deformation is elastic and reversible. At some point, the slope changes and the rate of increase of strain with increase in stress increases dramatically. And this is the point at which the material has yielded and plastic flow is taking place. So there's the elastic region. Uh, the stress is proportional to strain and the constant of proportionality is Young's modulus, E. Deformation here is reversible because all you're doing is stretching the atomic interatomic bonds. You're not permanently changing the shape of the material. Um, so as it, if you increase the load, it goes up that line. If you then decrease the load, it goes straight back down that line and there's no offset at zero load. During plastic deformation, dislocations are moving. So the, de the deformation is taking place not by stretching the interatomic bonds, but by moving dislocations around, which allows the structure uh, to change in shape. And as a result of that, uh, beyond the yield stress, which we need to remember, the yield stress is the point at which the material or alloy begins, begins to deform plastically. So it's elastic below the yield stress and it's plastic above the yield stress. You also, re if you continue to load up the plastic loading curve, so you've yielded and you're continuing to add deformation, so the stress is continuing to rise. If you stop and unload at that um, purple point, what you'll find is you don't go back down the loading line because you permanently change the shape of the material. You go back down an unloading line, which is purely elastic, which means the slope is exactly the same as the slope of your initial elastic region, it's E. When you've taken all the load off, you find you have a permanent deformation. And of course, metal forming depends upon this because you're working in this region of plastic deformation to permanently change the shape of your material. And that plastic deformation is irreversible. Uh, you can only change that by putting a load on in the opposite direction and try and force it to yield in the opposite direction and deform in the opposite direction. Now, of course, at the end of a tensile test, you get failure. And that's where deformation localizes into a neck. It becomes unstable and it fails. So that's um, engineering stress, engineering strain. A couple of things to remember. 
is that elastic deformation is not a constant volume process because on average the atoms are moving further apart. If you remember Poisson's ratio for steel is 0.3, uh, which means that actually it's slightly increasing in volume when you pull it elastically because the bonds are moving further apart. Plastic deformation is a constant volume process. Poisson's ratio is 0.5. And that's because movement of dislocation, which allows the shape to change, does not on average move the atoms further apart. And we take advantage of the fact that plastic deformation is constant volume in simple forming calculations. Now, why would we want to move from engineering stress strain to true stress strain? Well, let's actually put some more stuff on this diagram. Here is our engineering stress, engineering strain, tensile test. And you can see we've got the elastic region, the yield stress, the ultimate tensile strength, which is the stress at the highest load, where necking is, starts, and then we've got final failure when the load's dropped off a bit. If we put true stress versus true strain on there, what you find is they're pretty well equivalent during elastic loading because there's little difference between true stress, engineering stress, true strain, engineering strain, when the strains are small, um, but as the load increases and as the strain increases during plastic deformation, you can see they diverge. The true stress, true strain curve is always above the engineering stress, engineering strain curve. And if you go down and sit down and do some sums in a spreadsheet, you'll see that's the case. So they're always above. And in particular, once a neck starts to form, the true stress, uh, true strain curve goes up quite sharply because in the neck, the area is the cross section is falling rapidly, which means the true stress is going up and the strain is localizing. So there's true stress versus true strain. Now, which strain measure should we use in metal forming? Well, let's do a simple thought calculation. Uh, let's take a bar of gauge length 10 millimeters and let's stretch it to 20 millimeters. That's a very big stretch, by the way. So it's the sort of thing you'll do in metal forming. Let's calculate the increment of engineering strain. So epsilon one is final length minus initial length divided by initial length, 20 minus 10 over 10, it's one. Now let's have another go. Let's stretch it by a further 10 millimeters. The increment of engineering strain is now 30 final length minus 20 initial length over 20 initial length, it's 0.5. It's smaller than first time round. Now, the total engineering strain over both those deformations, so going from right at the beginning to right at the end of the process, is not epsilon 1 plus epsilon 2, which is 0.5. It's actually 30 minus 10 over 10, which is 2. So engineering strains are not additive. They're only approximately correct at small strains, which suggests they might not be a good idea to use in a metal forming calculation. In contrast, the true strain, um, the logarithmic strain for the first increment is the log of 20 over 10, which is 0.693. For the second increment, it's the log of 30 over 20, which equals 0.405. And for the total, it's the log of 30 over 10, which equals 1.099. Now, you may notice if you add 0.693 to 0.405, you get 1.099. Epsilon E1, sorry, plus E2 equals E3. True strains are additive, which means they're quite useful for working with the large deformations associated with metal forming. OK, let's carry on a bit. I think we may have run beyond the I made a mistake with the recording by this stage but we'll carry on. Let's think about what goes on in forming. Now, strains in forming are large because the metal is deformed plastically. So we usually ignore any elastic deformation. Um, the elastic deformation takes place early on. It's a function of both the material you're forming and the stiffness of the machines you're forming in. So for simple calculations, we usually ignore it. Plastic deformation, takes place at constant volume. And so for a simple forming operation calculation, 
uh, we therefore often assume constant volume. And if the temperature doesn't change very much, then that's actually a good assumption. Uh, it's a very good assumption. Um, if the temperature changes a lot during your forming operation, which means you'll get thermal expansion and contraction, then you may need to make corrections. But for the sort of operations we're looking at, um, temperature changes are not great, and so you can ignore that. Now, we had then have a problem because a simple tensile test, data you get from that is only useful for strains that are small enough to avoid necking and instability. So we use two alternative tests to derive materials data for metal forming calculations, the bulge test and the compression test. The bulge test. So here we have some pictures of a bulge test. Uh, what we do here is we take a disc of sheet, we clamp it onto a die. So the picture on the right is showing you have a die, a lower die. You clamp the sheet onto it by a ring, the upper die, clamp it good and hard so that you're able to pressurize the gap underneath the sheet. And then you pump it up with fluid up to pressure, which causes it to bulge. And once it's bulged, you can see how much it bulges before it fails. So you apply hydraulic pressure to one side of a clamped circular sheet specimen. It deforms into a dome. And that dome imposes a biaxial stress state because it's pressurizing. It's like blowing up a balloon. And that generates stresses in two directions in plane, which is representative of what happens in deep drawing. So this is actually quite a useful test to estimate whether you can do a deep drawing operation with the material you've got to hand. It's useful because it can achieve true strains approximately twice those in a tensile test. That's because bioxial loading is more stable against the formation of a neck than the simple uniaxial tensile test. And we can use the height at which it bursts, the dome height or the bulge height, as a measure of how easy it is to form it. It's a crude measure of how much deformation you can put in before it breaks. For the same thickness of material, a larger dome height at bursting implies better formability. So you can use this to rank the materials you have available to see which are most formable. The bulge test can be used to check batch to batch variability in the raw sheet material, which is very useful because you need to be sure before you commit to making a load of deep drawn components that the material you've bought in meets its specification and you won't get a whole load of defective components out at the other end. And now the compression test. Um, we'll stop at the end of this because I think I'm by now repeating myself. Most forming operations that we worry about, like extrusion or forging or rolling, are actually putting compressive loading in because you can put much more strain in, in compressive loading before the thing fails, because there'll be no instability, no neck formation. What you do is you take a cylinder of the material of height H and you can put it between two platens and you squash it. And what you do is you measure the relationship between the applied load and by how much it compresses. So you compress it between flat platens and you look at the variation of load with the platen movement. And this provides stress strain data that can be used in processes like forging, rolling and extrusion that are basically putting compressive loads in. Now, there are problems with all real world tests. There are problems. And the problem with the compression test is caused by friction and it's called bulging. Friction between the platen and the, 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 uh, the cylinder causes a specimen to bulge. And that's because the frictional forces are acting to resist the top of that cylinder sliding along the platens. And so what you'll find is with friction, you get more, you get bulging, you get more radial expansion in the middle and less at the top, which means your simple assumptions about what's going on are wrong. So 
The way you get round this is to try and minimise friction. And typically you need lubricant and you need a means of getting that lubricant onto the platen surfaces in adequate quantities. So what you do is you machine annular rings in the top and bottom of your specimen and you fill in with an appropriate lubricant and that allows you to minimise um, bulging. Now, if you can minimise friction and bulging, if you work out the stre true stress versus true strain response from a compression test, it will be exactly the same as the true stress versus true strain response in a tensile test, but you'll be able to get that data to much higher strains because there's no bulging, uh, sorry, no necking. Right, we'll stop now because I believe we can now switch to the live video. So thank you for um, listening to this. And you can now switch to the live video to carry on. So let's.